uh, have our first uh, speaker, Carl uh, Medley from the Flatiron Institute at the Center of Computational Mathematics. Um, and Carl is going to talk about uh, measuring the change in coastal flooding, uh, coastal flooding risk uh, from a multi-hazard perspective. Bear with me for just a second. Nothing explodes. Say that jokingly, but that once happened to me. This is my fault. It is, I say that jokingly, but it actually is my fault. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, but you didn't know that I was going to, you're going to have to listen to me again. Uh, I tried to keep that quiet. Um, so I am here. I'm actually semi-local over in New York City um, at the Flatiron Institute. Um, and today I'm going to talk about some of the things that uh, myself and my colleagues have been working on um, that are of interest to this community. Um, a lot of it has to do with the changing risk we know is happening due to climate change. Um, so a lot of this is very difficult to quantify, as many of you know. Um, so a lot of the work that I'm specifically involved in is not just doing this risk analysis, but also creating the tools um, to catalyze and enable that uh, work. Um, so we have to talk about things like storm climatology, how are storms changing into the future, um, we're very focused on the storm problem and coastal flooding and erosion. Um, so we have to have some idea of what storms are going to look like in the future. Also extending the historical um, uh, his, uh, set of storms that exist. Um, we have taken into account sea level rise and all its complexity. Um, so that's clearly very important. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in these problems. Um, in some sense, risk analysis does allow us to kind of hide some, some of this uncertainty um, because we're looking at a statistical uh, question as it is, um, but we still do want to say what is the uncertainty propagating through our models um, from the climate models and everything else in between. Um, and eventually, we do want to get down to being able to uh, create products like, uh, you know, risk curves, or in this case, return periods, so that we can make decisions, inform decisions, and you know, let the humans, the decision makers, that are stakeholders, make those decisions in, in an informed way. Um, so th there's all sorts of things that go in between all this stuff, and we try to bring it all together in an easy way, but also make it actually manageable. We don't want to spend you know, large amounts of supercomputing time to do this. Uh, we want to be able to actually give the tools all the way down to the local communities that can also do this, these types of questions. So today I'm going to actually just give you a really brief outline of how we do this, some of the modeling tools that we've developed and use, and then a, a couple of projects that uh, have used them. Um, so first off, I just want to talk about that storm surge modeling. Um, so those of you that don't know, storm surge generation is primarily wind driven. So you have the strong winds from a storm a hurricane, tropical cyclone, uh, more generally, uh, pushes the water up against the coast. It's held there. It should, if gravity has it, had it way, go back down. So it's kind of, in that sense, somewhat simplistic. Of course, there's a lot of things in its way. Um, people, houses, things that we care about. Um, the pressure does come into a, uh, to uh, play a role as well, but it's kind of smaller. Um, so it's primarily wind-driven. Of course, the wind, if you've ever stood out in any type of weather, is very difficult to actually quantify. Um, so one of those sources of uncertainty. Um, so the tool that we've developed, as mentioned yesterday, is called GeoClaw. Um, and just a shout out, which I'll do again. There is a clinic today, if you are so inclined and want to learn more 
um, get your hands, uh, some hands-on time with it. Uh, that is this afternoon, it's Clinic 3.3 in room 2046. I think that's updated and correct. Um, so what is GeoClaw? So it's a, it's a package, a software package. Um, the underlying parts of it are in Fortran, but it's wrapped in Python, so you can interact with it at that level. Uh, it does multiple different types of uh, shallow flows, um, so storm surge, tsunamis. Um, we do have some sediment transport capabilities that we've played with, landslides, debris flow, um, all sorts of things. Uh, and kind of the, the key parts of this are trying to make it go fast and be more accurate than you would usually be able to do. So a big component of that is adaptive meshing. So I'll show you a little bit more about that. Um, we handle, in a hopefully robust way, uh, topography. You feed it in and it figures out what to do with it. Um, it is parallelized, um, so that's key to doing many, many runs. Um, and it can do all sorts of things. You can kind of add equations into it um, if you have something more interesting going on than just simple shallow water. Uh, so adaptive mesh refinement. Um, so this, is, this isn't anything more than just advection, so stuff being moved around in a swirl. And what I'm going to show you as we go here is the grid so it's a bunch of Cartesian grids kind of in set inside of each other. And it follows this gradient, this jump in the quantity of interest. Um, so these are the grid cells getting smaller. And in here, I'm not drawing the grid cells. It would just be black. So you can see it automatically decides where to put that resolution for you. So this is great. If you have thousands of storms to run, for instance, you don't have to decide exactly where that storm is. It does that all for you. Um, you can, of course, control it as much as you would like, because some of us have control issues. Uh, but uh, it can do a lot of that for you. So how does this work? So in this particular type of adaptive mesh refinement, uh, you can think of it as layering more and more inset grids, but we're actually not cutting out. We're actually calculating underneath those grids. So it's a layer cake, so to speak. Um, so the coarsest level covers everything, and the finer levels are on top of that and on top of that. So there's lots of parameters here you can play with, but when, when it comes down to the end of the day, it just kind of projects down, you see the, this inset vision, uh, at least in 2D. But um, so here's a little bit more of a geophysically relevant case. Um, this is, uh, actually, it's fictitious, so don't, don't worry, person that was from Chile that was here presenting yesterday. Um, uh, of a Chile 2010 tsunami uh, as it crosses the Pacific. Um, so again, we're drawing some of the grid cells on the coarsest level, um, and where it's a little too fine to draw the grid cells, we're not drawing them. But as the tsunami crosses the Pacific, we can allow the code to just kind of figure out where to put the resolution. We can follow the wave front. Uh, in this particular case, we were really interested in Hilo, Hawaii, which eventually the tsunami hits. Um, and in this case, if we zoom in here, we can actually resolve the, uh, the harbor area uh, when it needs to be. So we're, not, we're actually not doing it the entire time. We're allowing the code again to, to do it when it needs to. And we can get a pretty good and accurate resolution at the point we, we need it to be there. So that was Tsunami. This is a storm surge example, um, which is a little bit more relevant to what I'm talking about. Um, this is Hurricane Ike. Um, just to give you a little bit more detail in this particular case, um, this is the entire domain on the right, and I'm going to plot the wind and those, those grids as they move. Uh, and then on the left is a zoom in on Galveston and Houston. So that's where Hurricane Ike really did most of its damage. Um, so the left is a, a plot of the sea surface. So zero would be sea level um, as we go. Um, and then the, that chart at the top is the number of levels. We use seven levels and the ratios of resolution between the levels. You can see as the water pushes up into various areas in the Houston, Galveston area, um, we see overtopping, inundation, and things like that. Um, so overall, this actually allows us to do a simulation on, actually at this point, a fairly old laptop um, where a similar type of resolution simulation could actually require thousands of cores to do in a reasonable amount of time. So uh, the idea here is that we are enabling the, the of being able to run lots of these simulations very quickly and without a lot of guidance, um, which is kind of what we want for questions like risk. So moving on to some of the example uh, applications we've been working on. Um, one of them is coastal protection and, and optimizing that coastal protection. So in this case, 
sorry to Julia, who was talking about uh, more natural uh, protection mechanisms. This is a barrier um, in this particular case. Um, we start out small, want to move up to that. Um, and this is actually a local, this is the tip of Manhattan, and we're thinking about trying to protect lower Manhattan um, from something like Sandy, but you'll see we're actually considering a, a large ensemble of climate form storms. Um, so the optimization is actually not where we're going to put the wall. We're saying there's only so many places we can put one, um, but how high does it need to be? Um, so each of the, there's a bunch of segments here I'm not showing where I can say exactly how high that wall needs to be. Um, and I'm just asking the code to tell me that. Um, so this is a very common optimization type problem. You have a you know, strategy you want to test out. You run it through your model. You try to calculate damage. Uh, this is one of the more complicated steps in this. Uh, we do try to bring in stakeholder interviews. So this was with the city um, and state officials in the area. Um, and then we measure the suitability of that and then rinse and repeat. So uh, very, uh, in this case, straightforward optimization loop that we're trying to do. It's the components that are complicated, of course. Um, so modeling, we actually we use GeoClaw as well as another uh, GIS-based method. It's not bathtubbing, but it's something that's similarly fast. Um, so it allows water to kind of get places that it wouldn't in a bathtub model, um, but it does take uh, half a second to run. Um, so that way we can explore the, the optimization space much more efficiently and quickly. Um, and then when we get to somewhere we think might be a local minimum, we can explore it with a more expensive code and then also say, I have 100, say, uh, possible optimizations. Let's just run those at a high resolution uh, with, say, something like AdCirc. Um, so the economics component is really important. It's really complicated. It's really hard to do for those of you who have tried to do this. Um, we had a lot of help from uh, agencies like the MTA, so that's the local subway, buses, how we get around around here, um, and uh, the fire department, the police department, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, we also use the, the Army Corps' uh, kind of model for this, has this, to, to map loss and damages um, from flood levels. Uh, we have a great amount of data in New York City that's freely available, which really helped as well. Um, so we can actually start to do things like estimate the damage of the subway, estimate damage to various buildings and their use cases, and create curves like the curves in the bottom corner. So given a certain flood height at a particular point, what's the total loss, which is really what we're interested in. But you know, if you're really interested in inventory loss, physical damage loss, income loss, that's actually also broken down. Uh, in terms of the ensemble we're using, this is, it is climate informed, but not, not as fully as like using a GCM in general. Um, we're working up to that, uh, but we do have uh, extratropicals or warm, excuse me, tropical cyclones, warm weather storms, summer storms, and cold weather or extratropical storms. Uh, they're colored and suggestive colors here. Um, so as time goes on and we're taking into account sea level rise or one of the estimates of sea level rise, uh, you can see us doing a lot of different storms. And if you cut through uh, vertically through this plot, you could get a histogram of the, of the possibilities. Um, and so you could actually construct a risk curve for each year if you were so inclined. Um, you notice that this isn't directly, this isn't, uh, the y-axis isn't depth of water, this is actually damage. Um, so we're actually trying to estimate the total damage loss um, in this particular case for a uh, maximum, I think, surge level in a particular year. So that allows us actually to run an optimization. In this particular case, we aren't doing something super fancy. It's kind of a brute force method. Let's just search the space and hopefully we find something. So it's an MCMC type of thing. Um, but surprisingly, I was surprised, there is actually a minimum. Um, so these curves here, the orange curve is the implementation cost. How much does it cost to build this particular protection mechanism? This is somewhat monopoly money. It's an estimate. I, that's a really hard thing to estimate. Um, but it's going up as the higher the, the overall barrier gets, it costs more. Uh, the total damage cost, how much does it cost? Uh, if we didn't have a high enough barrier, water gets over. So as we build a higher barrier, we get less damage cost. And the addition of those two curves is going to be the total expected cost, right? Because the, the barrier is expensive. Uh, damage is expensive, so we might need to look at both of those. And so you see that there's actually a minimum at a, a 
a number of different configurations. Um, so we decided to actually run this through GeoClaw just to make sure everything was working. And so a billion dollar barrier, which isn't quite uh, at the low minimum, um, but if you only had a billion of this monopoly money, uh, you could protect something. Uh, and actually, this, it's the left here. You can see actually the water came behind the barrier um, in this particular case, uh, not great. Um, in the $2.1 billion barrier in this particular configuration, um, that tip of Manhattan, if you're not familiar, is Battery Park. It is a park. You're actually thinking about using it as a place for water to get kind of absorbed and, and hardened. Um, so this is actually one of the, the options that seemed to be the most uh, viable. Uh, it protected uh, most of the areas. It's not clear of damage, but it had a minimum. Um, and just to kind of add this, the next step in this also, we're trying to do a compound hazard. In this particular case, compound means disease, pandemic. I'm not going to say the C word. Uh, but that was where we were coming from on this. What would happen if we had a hurricane? We had to evacuate people. In New York City, that means bringing everybody together into shelters, which, of course, as we learned, is not a great thing to bring a bunch of people close together in tight quarters. Uh, and expect that to end well. Um, so we started asking the question, maybe there's another uh, approach to this. In this particular case, we were using some analysis from the city and with the city to say, OK, how many people could we get to, to shelter in place? How many people could we actually get in, if we decrease the amount of people in these shelters and maybe distribute them more widely? Uh, and you can kind of go forward from that. Um, so this is ongoing research uh, that we're hoping to uh, actually, well, Hoping never to have to use, but it's something we're thinking about. Um, so lastly, I want to talk about two uh, quick uh, newer uh, projects. Um, that uh, is the compound part of this is compound flooding due to precipitation and storm surge. Um, so the first one I want to call out, um, this was with Summer Institute, the National Water Center Summer Institute. Last summer, um, some students there, and I encourage all the graduate students in the room if you're interested in hydrology and working with uh, NOAA, the National Weather Service, uh, this is a great seven-week program in Alabama. Um, they took uh, basically kind of what I just described along with also the National Water Model, combined those things and did compound flooding um, for lower Manhattan and Manhattan in general. Um, and kind of the interesting thing here that they, they moved forward was they used machine learning to do attribution studies. Um, so this is something that some of the, the networks you can train will give you as you train them. Um, so in this case, up and down the coast of uh, Manhattan, we can see uh, what the total flooding was due to or what it was estimating it was due to. And by and large, it's not changing too much depending on what side of the island you're on. Um, surge is primarily what happened um, in this particular case. Um, river discharge would be water coming from upstream of the Hudson for the most part, uh, and then precipitation flooding. So it does change a bit depending on where you are, uh, but it was somewhat consistent uh, with that. Uh, and finally, uh, a brand new uh, study that we've been working on for a couple of years now, uh, it was just published uh, this spring, uh, is trying to take all this in, take the climate change, the best estimates for climate change, best estimates for tropical and tropical cyclone precipitation, combine that all and look at uh, up to 2100 uh, and look at differences. So we're taking into account storm climatology, um, sea level rise, all the things. Uh, so this is kind of the takeaway um, for tropical cyclones anyways. We have three different uh, risk curves or return curves. Um, blue, uh, blue, yellow, and red uh, are going further in time. So, so the one furthest down is, of course, now. And as you go up, it gets worse. The curves are moving to the... I have to turn around, left. Um, and so it's kind of what we we're expecting. There's a number of different uh, uh, climate models going into this, a number of different uh, uh, ensembles inside those climate models. So this is a kind of what we'd want to do if we were doing climate risk um, and looking at this. Uh, Sandy is the dashed line. I think you can see that. So it, it does kind of jive with what we think. Um, the difference between the left and the right plots here is sea level rise. So it happens here in New York City. Uh, in the New York City area, sea level rise is really a an important aspect of this. You can see the curves uh, shift quite a bit. So this isn't just adding sea level rise. This is actually looking at the dynamic aspect of it. 
Um, we haven't quite done the analysis, say how important is it just adding it versus running it, uh, but it does make a difference. Um, we also do this for extropicals as well, because those are important around here. Um, you can see it's a bit of a different uh, thing. This is newer because extratropicals are very difficult to come up with synthetic versions of. Um, we don't want to just pick them out of the climate models. We want to actually uh, upscale those uh, and downscale both ways. Uh, so, uh, but this is something we got, and it does seem to kind of jive with what we think is going on. So just to conclude, there's lots of references that I went through kind of quickly, so if you're interested, take a picture of that. Um, current directions we're, we're going in, um, we are looking at multi-layer flows. So you could think, especially in this community, um, heavy sediment uh, layers or you know, there's all sorts of things that you might be interested in um, that way. So sediment transport more specifically. We do versions of this right now, so barrier island breaching, uh, things like that, um, but we're, there's always more to do there. Um, ML applications, I showed one in this particular case, but there's lots of other physical processes that we could imagine using uh, machine learning for replacing. Um, we do have some code that does embedded boundaries. So as I said, this is a Cartesian grid code. If you wanted to have a boundary that was, say, a barrier or something else uh, and not have your grid conform to it, how do you handle that numerically without a lot of cost? Um, a lot of risk assessment tools we're developing um, recently, there's, uh, there's dispersion wave equations, so Boos and S, Sarai, Green, Nagdi equations are possible. Um, we also have some wind wave models uh, that we're trying to incorporate that don't take forever. Um, yeah, so with that, I will stop. And also shout out that uh, there's a clinic, so come to it. See, have fun with us. Uh, and if you want the code or you want some documentation and all that stuff, you can find it at clawpack.org. So thank you. Should I, should I do <laughs> Thank you. I was curious, you had that beautiful plot of the adaptive mesh initially, and how much does the knob tuning to perfect that depend on process, like fluvial floods versus tsunamis? And is there one that's anecdotally tricky? Or is it trivial? Is it just work for every process? Oh, no. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, it does take some uh, tuning, depending on what you want to do. Um, by and large, once you cut, like, when I, when I, what do we say, tuning, storm surge generally, if you have a particular coastline, say the Atlantic seaboard, you can kind of tweak it to, to do the right thing. If there's particular places you're interested in, sometimes that can be nice to say, I want you to make sure to have the right resolution or a resolution right around, say, New York City or Duck, North Carolina or whatever. Um, it's generally pretty robust, but it does tend to matter what the processes are involved and where they're occurring. Uh, now, that being said, you could also come up with the criteria. So I didn't mention this at all, but there are criteria behind the scenes here that are being evaluated to decide where to put resolution. So for, for instance, uh, uh, channel flow and all its ways and shapes and forms, uh, we do detect pretty well just by looking at the speed of the water. Uh, in the direction of the water. Uh, but you can come up with all sorts of interesting ways to, to try to figure out what's going on where. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. She, she always talks to me. I didn't have to know. <laughs> um, <laughs> OK. Um, I was curious about, it was really neat. I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, I was curious about some of, and you talked about like the trade-offs in efficiency and model computational time in terms of adaptive mesh versus running like very high resolution um, meshes. But I was curious if, um, is this, this, are the gains in computational efficiency, how does it compare to using like triangular or hexagonal meshes or something where you can get, like just use stable meshes where you need it, like for something like storm surge where you sort of know where you're gonna need the high resolution. Yeah, so, um... 
the study that I showed was actually compared to AdCERC, a, the optimized AdCERC grid for Houston Galveston for Hurricane Ike. Um, and that particular run, uh, you know, that's not the same, you know, result. We compared fairly similarly um, to just the accuracy of both. Um, AdCERC took, it was, I think, if I remember right, it was 4,000 core run, took about 30 minutes to an hour of, of wall time. Um, the same run on Geoclaw took 30 minutes to an hour, but on a laptop. So now, are those apples to apples? No. Um, and I actually, I'm a firm believer in saying, you know, like use Geoclaw to maybe do this larger ensemble stuff where we don't exactly know what might be interesting. And then when you know what's interesting, go down to something like an AdCERC and run even fewer model runs uh, where you really know exactly what the channels are and what all these details are. Um, so it, I guess it's a little bit of a cop-out answer. <laughs> um, it, it can be much more efficient, and it is because, it, actually, an AdCERC is a good example. Uh, although it can get to similar resolutions overall, uh, because we're not doing it for all time, uh, that's a huge benefit. Um, it also doesn't need steering. You don't have to sit there and create the grid beforehand, which can be, I've done it, it's time consuming. <laughs> um, so you can do things like a thousand storms really easily uh, without knowing a lot of information uh, uh, beforehand. Uh, but yeah, there's other efficiencies in the background due to the numerical methods being used and things like that, but uh, that's kind of the broader. But well, we can talk later if you're really, really interested in what's going on. <laughs> that was Marcia. I just wanted to follow up on your last point about machine learning can play more of a role What in some processes, and I'm wondering which ones you think could be more useful. I, I personally feel like the, the physical processes that won't have a great handle on are difficult to represent physically. Um, sediment transport, although we know something about it, is I think a really great opportunity for that. Hydrology also has proven to be uh, tricky. Again, we know the physics, but it's hard to do know all the information about it. Um, so I could see a data-driven approach to be really useful there. Uh, uh, wind waves as well. There was a poster. I don't see where he is. Oh, there he is. Uh, yesterday about using uh, machine learning uh, uh, based models to do wind waves. Uh, wind waves are incredibly expensive um, and difficult to do, and if we could replace it with a machine learning model that could do the same thing, it would be a great boon. So uh, not throwing everything away, but you know, kind of the best of both worlds um, types of things. Thanks. <laughs>